but like if, if something does go wrong with the with the orbital launch uh, it will it's, it's really much more of a fireball than it is an explosion uh, but it is quite a big fireball Hello and welcome back to The Unknown Experience. Today we look at the third segment of the interview between an everyday astronaut and Elon Musk. And after that we'll take a look at the progress at Starbase, courtesy of NASA space flight. Without further ado, let's jump into it. Is the... Is the... Is the, what call, is the blast... Is the radius actually going to change the exclusion zone a little bit when... When Super Heavy gets a... Uh, Starts launching and do the full stack. Um, well, we definitely won't have people. We'll clear the whole area uh, for orbital launches, like like Stargate and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we might have a small crew. Um, you know, with some shield. You know, like a rope in a robust. Uh, you know, some shielding on the roof and and strong glass. Uh, like if, if something does go wrong with the uh, with the orbital launch, uh, it will. It's it's really much more of a fireball than it is an explosion, uh, but it is quite a big fireball. There's actually there's actually a Russian rocket that was built between the late 1960s and the early 1970s, uh, where it did happen to turn into a gigantic fireball. But more about that on my next video. Hey, how's it going? Let me, let me, let me give it to you something. Okay. This one. This for you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks. We're going to make it. All right, cool. We're going to make it. Hey, Sam. Hey. Right, Sam. Thanks, Zero. Hey. Hell yeah. Uh, cool. How's it going, guys? All right. Actually, Taylor has a plan as of right now. Okay. Yeah, we're <laughs> we rolled this thing over today, so it's all in place. Both cranes are in their set location for tomorrow. Okay. Tonight, we are going to re-rig everything. Do you guys mind being on camera or anything? It's just a... Uh, I can always blur you out. Very you shy. <laughs> Sam, I know you are. Yeah, it's okay. It's just an iPhone camera. But <laughs> all good, all go good. ahead. Yeah, so tonight we pre rig. We're obviously doing that. Hey, can you stop vlogging on my laptop? Pre rig and all. Our crane operators get in at 7 a.m. tomorrow. Get everything finally hooked right. up. We do our pre right. test. Okay. Right. We'll see the launch zone and the big things that right. we don't have sliding around. But later on in this interview, you'll hear a couple of interesting things about the cranes on site. I counted at least 15 grains working at once. Within 11 hours. 11 hours, okay, cool. Yeah. Great, yeah. awesome. You, you want to head up to the top and I'll show you what our game plan is over there? Uh, sure. Now they're standing on top of the um, orbital launch platform, but remember this was before the ring section was mounted on top of this, just before the Super Heavy Booster and the Starship SN20 was uh, stacked. Largest train in the world, third largest train in the world. We have two operators for, for that big. So one, one guy from our team, Dave Wright, is going to run the yellow. Giovanni is going to be on the big train. Okay. So that they can, they're going to load share appropriately and get this thing up. So Dave Wright and Giovanni are apparently some of the crane drivers, or at least two of them that's working on the site with these gigantic cranes. And like you heard, the uh, third largest crane in the world, la uh, second largest crane in the world. So these are big um, machines. So big thumbs up to the guys operating these cranes. I think they've got a lot of responsibility on their shoulders. Great. This is brilliant because we would have spent four days reconfiguring this thing. The whole time this place has been developed has been like down to your counting every minute and second. I saw the crane operators. Yeah. What would you do if there's an asteroid heading to this planet in eight days? Yeah, exactly. That, that's, what they, they, that's what they were told today. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, who knows, maybe there is. Yeah, I mean, you never know. I think if, if we operate with 
extreme urgency. That's quite interesting. Um, yeah, you could start a whole conspiracy theory based on what's, uh, well, the word exchange is taking place here, but yeah, nonetheless. Then we have a chance uh, of making life multi-planetary. Uh, still just a chance, not for sure. If we don't act with extreme urgency, that chance is probably zero. Uh, and the rate of innovation is not going to be constant. It's either going either to increase the rate of innovation or it's going to slow down. If you look at uh, you know, American access to, to space with uh, crew, uh, we were able to go to the moon in 69. Then, uh, then with the space, space shuttle, we can only go to low Earth orbit. And the space shuttle retired. And then for almost a decade, there was no, um, America had no access to space for the people. So, this is a pretty bad trend, you know, it's right. trending to zero. Right. Um, we need a very strong trend in the other direction in order to have any chance whatsoever of making life multi planetary. Yep. So that's the reason for the extreme sense of urgency. It's legitimate. Yeah, I mean, I'll be long dead before, you know, Mars is self-sustaining, but uh, hopefully the momentum is strong in that direction by the time I die. Hopefully, which hopefully isn't soon, but no, no. Oh, it's very impressive. Oh, it's great to see uh, the progress. Yeah, nice work, guys. So that was the segment brought to us by the Everyday Astronaut. Um, check out his uh, channel and uh, I'll leave the link in the description to this video so you can check out the full interview with Elon Musk. So you can see the sense of urgency in terms of development and developing the Starbase to get this done. Speaking of developments, let's check out NASA space flight. Um, yeah, NASA space flight, 24 seven coverage. I usually show you guys the highlights. I'm going to do the same once more again today. So this is Starbase, Boca Chica, and that was the sunrise. Beautiful, isn't it? There you can see the super heavy booster number four next to the launch tower. And on this specific occasion, it's moving back to the construction site. Or I would rather say it got tired of standing around and it's going to look for SN20. There you can see it passing Starhopper, its great grandfather to be honest. Starhopper was tested successfully on a 150 meter hop about two years ago, just shy of two years ago, with the first Raptor engine being used. And there it's passing its father to be honest, booster number three. They used booster number three with three Raptor engines to do st static fire a while back as well. Booster number four on its way to look for its mates. It's better half, or let's say upper half. Well, there's actually a bar on the, uh, on the high bay. Maybe it's going for a drink, who knows. I refer to booster number four as a he and the Starship as a she. There you can see Starship 20 moving out of the bay uh, at the construction site. You'll see the labels are still attached, green and orange. Um, I was actually speaking to a number of people on the NASA space flight site and well, between the bunch of us, we um, well think that these labels are green for uh, good, red for not good, or orange not for good, in terms of tiles being um, in need of replacement or being too far apart. So yeah, but time will tell. And there you can see the, let me just remind this for a second. There you can see next to uh, SN20, you can see a bit of a nose cone sticking up, that white section with the American flag on it. That's actually a mock-up of a um, lunar starship lander. And like you know, um, well, some of you might know, uh, NASA awarded a contract to SpaceX to design a lunar lander. 
Um, I think it's between two and three billion dollars, but this is supposedly in jeopardy. I don't know if it's still going to happen. My next video will explain why I'm saying this, and I'm going to introduce you to someone on my next video. There's a nose cone section. There you can still see the coloring on the heat shield tiles, the orange. Uh, on this occasion, I only see orange, so I, I take it that that's that tiles that needs to be replaced. And there you can see the fixed section of the Ford flaps that Elon Musk referred to as a design flaw that will possibly be uh, adjusted or redesigned for the next model of Starship. And we're still looking at BN4 on the move towards the bar or, well, production site or to his better half. The crawlers they use to transport these heavy things are quite impressive. You'll see it when it once it passes by. It's actually quite a small thing, the crawler itself. And there you can see all the Raptor engines exposed. Um, I think they're going to add some kind of a protective cover or a skirt along the sides to cover the Raptor engines that's exposed there. But then again, you never know. Um, I refer to Boosterful as being male and to Starship being female. Um, so there's something hanging out that should not be hanging out. So they're probably going to put some pants on this guy. And this is 29 Raptor engines. Once finished, there might be 33 or 34. Which, which would make it the most powerful rocket booster ever built. There in the distance you can see GSE tank number 6 if I'm not mistaken. I'm saying hi to booster number 4. And bye. GSE tank on its way to the launch site, to the fuel farm if I'm not mistaken. Integral part to the operation. Like I said previously, there is a bar at the top of the um, high bay, but Elon Musk said they've never used it. I think they're too busy. GSE tank moving as well as no tank uh, booster number four. The Starship already removed from the high bay. So booster number four and ship number 20 is almost reunited. <laughs> the grid fins you see at the top of this uh, booster number four, each could weigh as much as, well, a couple of tons. They are used to stabilize the booster during flight when it comes back down to land. Nice view of the crawler that they use to transport these heavy um, rocket boosters. So there we go, booster number four and SN20 reunited. Or are they? No, no. I think he's moving past. Yeah, he's definitely moving past. Yeah, he is ignoring her. This officially became the tallest rocket on Earth, standing 120 meters high. Well, one stacked. There you can see the bar in the high bay next to booster number four. That last section at the top. So 29 Raptor engines attached there. Soon to be possibly up to 33. My next video I'll feature a different rocket that also had 30 rocket engines. Look at this view. I think it stands close to 69 meters tall, this booster. Without the Starship. And there you can see the grid fins, a couple of tons each for stabilization during flight. Yep. He's ignoring her. Like I said, I refer to booster number four as he and starship number 20 as she. And he's ignoring her, he's going straight to the bar. Do you see that? Did you notice? Mm. 
Oh, he's, he's definitely stronger than her. He can lift a lot. His job is to lift her up. <laughs> but she can operate in space. She's got vacuum raptor engines that he does not. And there we go. Booster number four back inside the high bay. So that was booster number four's journey back to the construction site or, well, to the bar. Thanks for joining me for this update and please remember to subscribe to The Everyday Astronaut as well as NASA Space Flight to get regular updates. And also please give me a like, subscribe to my channel by clicking on the channel logo on the bottom right hand of your screen and thanks for watching and stay tuned for the next video on NASA and believe it or not potentially the ANC or something they might actually have in common. But as usual, stay safe.